You know, we were here last night till late. I had a wonderful time connecting with uh, people from long ago and not so far away. But as we were going home, we are talking about life on this campus. I love this campus. By the way, I thought Gordon Beach just did a masterful job this morning teaching the lesson for us. Yeah. You, you've been blessed. You got the right president. We're driving home. We're thinking about Andrews University because that's where we're from. And no, we're not going to change the name of Andrews University. I promise you that. Right. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> nice try, Ed. I may change your name, but we're not changing the name of Andrews <laughs> University. <laughs> so we're going home. Karen and I to our little motel in Utua. And we're talking. We're talking about the church. And you're, you guys are in some kind of leadership transition coming up here. I mean, Gordon's already announced he's, he's leaving. The general conference, we're, we're going to gather in San Antonio in a few days. And my Lord, what's going to happen to the church? I think about that. I pray about it. I'm, a, I'm just a little old servant in, of the church. But oh, I, want, I, want, I want somehow for us to move beyond dead center. And hey, you guys that are young, I've got 3,500 of you at Andrews University. And I like hanging around the young, and I've had the privilege of doing so for 32 years now. And I tell you why, because I keep believing that somehow, by the grace of God, somehow, we're going to hit a generation that will be the kickstart generation that will shove us into fast forward for the sake of 7 billion earth children on this planet. That's why I'm so excited, by the way, that you're having John Bradshaw here. I mean, that's a, that's a brilliant move on it, it is written's part, and I, I listened to John this morning. By the way, we, I heard John preach for the first time two weeks ago because he was in, in our pulpit preaching, and I love his preaching. I just love the way he preached two different sermons. How do you do that? I'm trying to, I'm trying to maybe trying to subconsciously copy him here by switching my sermon for the second time. <laughs> no, but anyway, I, I want to say about my friend John. What you've got coming up in uh, Impact Chattanooga, that is, that is high octane for the kingdom. High octane opportunity. I love the numbers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I heard the numbers in first service. Heard them again in second service. I love the numbers. God is doing something. But you can't tell me that those numbers represent heaven's vision no. and dream. No. Come on. That's right. Come on. What are we talking about? What are we talking about? Listen, I should be the one to talk. Michigan, Pioneer, what are we talking about? Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come for God to rewrite the future we had planned. That's what he did with Joseph. Come on, Joseph was absolutely sure when he had this vision, he had the dream. Man, everybody's going to bow down to me in this family. And we noted, we noted Wednesday night, that was, not, that was not a boast. There was no ego in that. He just said, hey, listen, he's 17 years old. He said, listen, I saw everybody bowing down to me. And his brothers hated him for it. He has a second dream, makes the mistake of telling them the, the second dream. And then his daddy hears about it, and his daddy says, boy, are you serious? You think your mother and I and all your brothers are going to bow down to you someday? You are crazy. But the verse reads there in chapter 37, he tucked the line away. He said, I'm going I'm to wait and see. This boy has the Midas touch. Stuff happens. And so far, so good. I'm not going to preach the first service sermon. Nope. The Lord just said, come on, stay what, what you're on. So if you want first service, it's too late. <laughs> no. If you want first service, get the tape. You guys record these? Are you recording them? Yeah, okay. God rewrites the future we have for ourselves. He'll do that for you young adults. He, do that, he does that for the, the middle agers here. He does that for the aged here. Moses is 80 years old. God says, rewrite the story beginning now. I need you to have forgotten the dream you had so that we can rewrite the same dream, only now in tandem, you and me. So Karen and I are going home last night, and I'm thinking to myself, what is it going to take to rewrite the dream for this university, for my university, Andrews University? What's it going to take to, to rewrite the dream for the North American division? Guys, we are treading water. 
it's as thick as mud, and we can't seem to make much progress. And I'm happy for the numbers we got here, but there are more where those came from, apparently. There are more where those came from in the Georgia Cumberland Conference. Impact Chattanooga will get us to some of them, not all of them. It's going to take God doing a new thing in our midst. Something new that we've never seen before. Hey, listen, I'm watching. I'm watching what's happening. I parse the headlines like every good Adventist does. I'm saying, hey, could the, God, could we get there from here? Could we get there from here? Could we get there from here? Every headline, I'm asking, could this be the one? I'm a fifth-generation Adventist, fourth-generation Adventist preacher. My forebears all preached the, the identical message week after week after week, and we're still here. Now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not dissing God. I'm not blaming him and saying, you really had a problem, didn't you? You had this big idea, and now you can't get there. He looks down at me and he says, boy, the problem is not me, it's you. When is the, how, how serious, how passionate are you for me to write the last chapter? Amen. I mean, you, you, do a, you, good, you do a good talk job, Dwight. Talk about, hey, I believe Jesus is coming, as we did Wednesday night, Boston, Fenway Park, Red Sox, come on, the last five minutes are critical, geometric progression, we're living in a time with a perfect storm, all the hockey stick grass will come up together, we did that Wednesday night to launch the Joseph series. He says, you do a fine, you, you talk the talk. I wish you'd walk the walk. I wish you'd put your prayers where your mouth is. You know what I mean by prayers where your mouth is? You get a little series, I'll do a new thing, and you do it, and you say, okay, we prayed for 90 days, what's next? Something is going to happen to this community of faith in the United States to break us out of the deadly status quo that is strangling us as a people. What's it going to take? Well, since you brought it up. <laughs> since you brought it up. Nobody in the church is saying that what you just said, and I won't quote you so that it doesn't go on live stream. Nobody in the church has said what you just said is the end all cure all for the kingdom of God on earth. It's simply following the example of Jesus and getting on with getting on and getting everybody on board. That's all it is. That's all it is. But you're right. It will not solve the problem. Our problem is a problem of the heart. We are not sold out on Jesus. We are not sold out on a soon coming Savior. And these kids, these young adults, they see it. They can smell it a mile away. Good talk, church. What difference is it making in my little town because you believe this way? We had two young pastors up here two, three nights ago. You know what? This younger generation of pastors, may I just talk candidly with you? I met with all the pastors yesterday with a completely different theme. But, you know, these younger pastors, God bless them. I'm not saying Ed Wright is old, but you know what I mean. <laughs> See? Because we're the same age. <laughs> so anyway, but the new, the, the new young pastors. I, I, I've preached at GYC. Have you ever heard of GYC? Mm-hmm. 7,000 people Sabbath morning I preached. Then I got invited to the other organization called The One Project. I said, if I go to one, I'll go to the other. I went. They gave me my assigned text. We preached through the Sermon on the Mount. You have the last passage. Two ways. Wide and narrow. Two trees, good and evil. Two fruits, true and false. Two groups, right and wrong. Two builders, wise and foolish. Two foundations, strong and sandy. There are only two, there are only two options to the human race. What you and I know about is the only option to life. 
The Seventh-day Adventist Church has been raised up as a little remnant community. And we'll talk about, don't, don't miss tonight because I'm not skipping my notes tonight. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has been raised up as a community to take God's last appeal to the dying race of humanity. I preached that sermon and then I went out with my uh, nephew, Von Nelson, my brother Greg's boy. He's associate pastor at La Sierra University Church. We had lunch together. Von was very polite and gracious and we went through, we had all the fun of just connecting uncle and nephew and then he says, Uncle Dwight, I need to say something. And he began to, un he began to open up his heart to his concern for a church that seems to be looking back more than it's looking forward. He's just a young kid. What is he, 34, 33? I'm telling you, the young in the church, don't you write them off. They're going to bring a paradigm shift that we desperately need. But God isn't waiting for the young to seize the moment. He's waiting for his entire family to grab the moment, seize the moment for the kingdom. So what do we do? Here's what we do. We make a decision. Because a friendship with Jesus is a decision, as William Miller put it, today and today and today until Jesus comes. We make a decision for a friendship with Jesus. And then we determine that by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will go out and live his radical life, his self-sacrificing love. We will live it in our humble little communities. John Bradshaw said, it's, it's right. You, you pray, you beg, you ask, God, let me find one for you today. Let me find just one for you this week in my neighborhood. Lead me to somebody who's ready to go but doesn't know. And may I be the agent to tell her, to tell him. Do a new thing in my life. You know, God makes that promise in Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I will do a, how's it go? I will do a new thing. You know what that new thing is? He tells us in the very next, the very next verses. He says, I will, pour, I will pour water upon those who are thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on on your offspring. We're going home last night and I'm saying, God, what is it going to take? 32 years? How many sermon series do we go through? Is there, is there, is there, is there a subject we haven't, we haven't covered yet? I woke up this morning early, earlier than I had wanted to wake up. And in the dark, God says, hey, I want to talk about that little conversation you and Karen were having last night. What is it going to take, Dwight? What's it going to take in your life? Are you willing to put everything on the line? Your career? Any modicum of success you may have? Are you willing to risk everything for the advancement of my end game strategy? Would you be willing to walk away from it all? Take up the cross, deny yourself, and come follow me. Would you be willing to? Hey, Seventh-day Adventist Church, I love you. And I will love you till I die, or till Jesus comes, whichever is first. But this morning, I'm compelled to invite you to make a decision at the foot of the cross. You say, Dwight, where's the cross? I want to go there for our closing text. Would you please go to the New Testament? John chapter 12. John chapter 12. <laughs> red, letter, red letter words in my Bible. John chapter 12. This is verse 23. Jesus speaking. By the way, this is Tuesday. Jesus will be dead 
uh, Friday. This is Tuesday before the Friday. He'll be dead by Friday afternoon. And Jesus replied, verse 23, the hour, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, what happens? If it dies, it produces many seeds. If you, if you plant just one little corn kernel in the ground, that's all you got. If you leave it on the surface of the ground, that's all you'll ever have. But if you will bury that corn kernel in the grave of the furrow of this earth, God promises that seed one day will burst forth and you'll have, you'll have, a, you'll have 200 kernels for one. That's his point. If a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Verse 25, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now here it comes. Verse 32, and I, let's read it out loud together. And I, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to my side. I will draw all people to me. Brothers and sisters of this church that we love, that's the appeal this morning. You came to camp meeting to connect, to thrive in the joy of each other's company and friendships. We came to worship and we have been much in worship already. But I'm impressed at this moment to invite you to go for broke and offer yourself lock, stock, and barrel to the Lord Jesus Christ and his endgame mission. It occurs to me that there are some here who once were a part of this community of faith. Stuff has happened in your life. Success has come and gone. It just happened on a, on a spur of a moment. I'll drop in and camp meeting. It's, the gym will be packed, and I'll just uh, hang on the edges, and then I'll go home. It occurs to me that some of you are here today who have just gotten drawn away from your friendship with Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity today, right now, to make a decision. You, you have the intellectual. You've got all the intellectual knowledge you need. It's not another Bible study you need. It's the heart saying, I'm willing to go for broke this time. I'm going to give you an opportunity to make that decision. And then there's another group that's here today. For whatever reason, <laughs> you, you just put off this decision about being baptized. I'll do it. I'll do it. Manana. I'll do it another time. And another time has gone on and on. I want, to make a, I want to make an invitation today. If you have not been baptized, I want to invite you to quietly, because you know the correctness of the decision, it is right to your mind and to your heart. I want to invite you today to decide, I want to be baptized. Nobody's going to be baptized today. Nobody's going to be baptized next week. But why not make the decision? Why not turn this worship moment as it ends into a decision moment. And then for all of us, I need to make an invitation for you to join me in saying, God, I am willing to do whatever it takes to be available to you for your end game. Whatever it takes. You can have my bank account. You can have my portfolio. You can have my career. You can have my, you can have my family. Well, I got one guy who's going to be in this thing all the way to the end. You go. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. I, I'm, I'm willing to give you whatever. I, I'm willing to give you everything, everything, so that you might be lifted up in my life because your promise... 
I just read it in the red letters here, Jesus. Your promise is if you are lifted up in my life, you will draw all people to you through me. Calvary lifts you up. I stand at the foot of the cross and I ask that you will remain lifted up in my life starting today until you come. The ushers are ready with a, with a little decision card. And I want to thank my friend Karen Carmen. That's what she was in college. We were the same class. Karen Carmen Payne, she's, she, she scrambled. And we were going to go a little bit of a different angle on this, but the, this little card will work. Thank you, thank you, Karen, for doing this in between services. I want you to get a card. It's a little half sheet, simple piece of paper like this. I want to give you an opportunity to register just, just to yourself and to the, to the, to the Holy Spirit is, who is, is, is hovered over you right now, as if there were nobody else in the universe, just you and the Spirit of God. I want to give you an opportunity to register your decision. These are coming your way. Then we'll have prayer, and the service will be concluded. Thank you for doing this. Bless you. There are three, there are three uh, responses here. See that first response? I receive Jesus' forgiveness and will offer it to the one who needs it. Let's make that one. I, want, I, I wish. I wish, in response to this word here in John 12, I wish to give everything I have to the Lord Jesus and make it available to Him today. They're coming your way. The second response is, I'm returning to Jesus, my Savior. You, just, you, you somehow ended up here at camp meeting, and I'm glad, grateful to God that you did. You ended up here at camp meeting, but you know that if Jesus were to come tonight, listen, listen, listen. If Jesus were to come tonight, you know in your heart, man, I just would not be ready to go to heaven. I would not be ready for him. I want to invite you to put a check mark right there and say, you know what? By the grace of the Lord Jesus, oh, to grace, how great a debtor. By his grace, I want my life to be his. Do whatever you need to in, in my life, Lord Jesus, but I'm giving it back to you. I want to come back to this church. I want to come back to this little community of faith. If you put a check mark in, the, in that second little blank, that'll be the decision. And then the third, I want to follow Jesus in baptism. You haven't been baptized? Hey, it'll never be more convenient and so simple and unexpected as this moment, just to put a check mark there. If you put your name and contact number, somebody will get in touch with you. You're not going to get baptized on the spot. That's not going to happen. You'll be able to take all the time you need. But why not? If you haven't been baptized and you came to worship at camp meeting, let's make the decision now. Why not? Jesus says, if I'm lifted up in your life, I will draw. I will draw you, and through you, I will draw. I'll draw the world to me. So that's it. Humble as it is, that's the appeal. The first, the first sentence, I want to I I I lay all of me and all of mine on the line for him. In fact, if you just scribble all at the top of that line, that's what I'm doing, and I'm putting a check mark right there. We're going to receive these. Turn right around and receive them. You say, Dwight, that's a, that's a big deal. Who, you fill out a, something like this, and who cares? You know what? You and I are experts at making decisions in our minds, quietly, with nobody else, and just say, well, you know, I think I'm going to do that. How many times, again and again and again, we have promised, we will, we will this time, putting it in writing. You're saying to yourself and to the Holy Spirit who... As you in his embrace right now, you're saying, all right, if this, is, if this is what you're asking of me, I'll put a check mark right there. I'll give you all. I don't know what all means for you. I know what it means for me. I don't know what it means for you, but would you be willing to say, Jesus, I give it all to you? Hey, this one, the, this, the second one, I once, was, I once was here. I'm not, but I want to come back to Jesus. If Jesus were to come tonight, I want to put my life in his hands, so that if he comes tonight, hallelujah, 
I'm his. I made the decision in worship at camp meeting at Georgia Cumberland. Put a check mark right there in that second line. And then the third line, simple. You haven't been baptized, whether you're a teenager, young adult, middle-aged, doesn't matter. You might be in your 80s and you've never been baptized. Hey, this is perfect for you. Why not? You're not making a decision to follow me. You're not making a decision to become a statistic. You're making a decision. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, then like a kernel of wheat, be buried. Be buried in the ground. And let me raise up a harvest out of your decision. You're making a decision to be buried in Christ. To follow Him for the rest of your life. Did you need a pen? We don't have any. <laughs> How about borrowing one from somebody beside you? Come on, share the pen. Look up and down the row. Maybe somebody's sitting there. I can't write with anything. Do you have a pen? I'm going to end with a story. A gentleman named, he's a gemnologist, by the way, a gentleman named Roy Wetstein, Tucson, Arizona. They're having, an, they're having a, a, rock, a rock hound convention in Tucson. And Roy Wetstein, a professional, he goes to the convention and he's just walking up and down the card tables. They're up there. They're from all over the states. He comes to a little card table, a display from a rock hound from Idaho, state of Idaho. Uh, <clears throat> on the card table is a Tupperware bowl and a piece of masking tape on the front of the bowl that reads $15, $15, and a pile of dusty rocks. So the uh, Wetstein, he, he reaches into the bowl and he feels the rocks and he latches onto one and he pulls it out and he holds it in front of his, he holds it in front of his face and he, he just turns it before his trained eye. And then he looks at the rock hand from Idaho and he says, you want $15 for this? And, he, and, and the rock hound grabbed a rock, took it back, and looked at it for a moment. He said, no, no, not this one. This has been here a long time. You can have it for 10 <laughs> True story. Rhett, Wetstein reached into his wallet, pulled out a crumpled $10 bill, and walked away with the world's largest star sapphire. 700 carats more than the previous record holder, the Black Star of Queensland, Australia, eight, uh, 1948. Estimated value, in the hands of gemnologists, $1.7 million. Man, we should have gone into rock collecting long ago. <laughs> but guys, here's the point. Here's the point. That rock hound has a Tupperware bowl filled with dusty rocks not knowing that the treasure of the universe is in that bowl, and he treats it as just another stone. We have 28 fundamental beliefs. Amen. Hallelujah. I am. <laughs> we have 28 fundamental beliefs. But my friends, I am telling you what, Inside that Tupperware bowl, there is the star sapphire of the universe. It is worth everything in this life and the life to come. Jesus says, I, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people to me. And all I'm asking on his behalf, really, on his behalf, all I'm asking is that you decide to let him be lifted up in your life. Would you be willing to put everything you have on the line for him? That's, that's blank number one. Would you be willing to come back to what your heart tells you has been truth all along? Would you be willing to come? We will welcome you with open arms. We desperately need you right now. And Jesus, who loves you, needs you too. If he were to come tonight, wouldn't you like to go to bed tonight knowing I have chosen him?
Listen, it's as simple as that. 1 John 5, 12. He who has the Son has life. She who does not have the Son does not have life. It's as simple as that. You take Jesus with just a check mark, but it's up here. You take him. You have life, and it's life eternal. If you've wandered away from Jesus, come on back. If I'm lifted up, I'll draw you. I'll draw you. Come to me. You're not coming to the church. You're not coming to a conference. You are coming to the star sapphire of the universe. And finally, number three, what is three? What is three? What's three? <coughs> Baptism. If you have not made the decision yet to immerse your life in the star sapphire and become all that he is offering you to become just like him. If you haven't followed Jesus yet in baptism, put a check mark there. Somebody from this conference will be in touch with you next week sometime. Then you just chart the course. It's time, ladies and gentlemen. The star sapphire. With the star sapphire as our sole possession, the revival that we've been praying for and begging for, piece of cake. Because the revival is not about the restitution of the church. It's about the raising up of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that's what will set the church ablaze. And then in five minutes, in five minutes, remember that illustration Wednesday night, in five minutes, the end can come. God's ready. It's time for the church to get ready. What do you say? Amen. Amen. All right. I want to pray with you. But I don't want to lose that card. Would you fold it in half right now? Right now. Would you fold it in half? And then would you, ha would you just please hand it to the aisle? The same friendly ushers who came a moment ago are going to come right back. Nobody's going home with this. Please. You say, God, I'm just rededicating my life. That's the first one. All. You're not going to rededicate half of your life, are you? It's all. Amen. Now, ushers, just give it. Uh, ushers, ushers, hold off. Just make sure they get all to you before you start picking these up. Yeah. Okay. So just, would you just, this way, this way. Bless you. You know what I want to do? I want to sing a song, ladies. I'm going to sing a song right now and call them this audible. Uh, Jesus, keep me near the cross. We're just going to sing the first stanza. We know it by memory. It's hymn 312. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There, a precious fountain. Flows, uh, was it that something about the healing stream? Flows from Calvary's mountain. That's it. Beautiful. Okay. They're still receiving these. Let's just sing that stanza, okay? You know it. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross there a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in the cross be I just gonna do the first dance of bless you, thank you. Ever till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Let's stand and Let's sing that chorus again as we stand for the benediction. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory. Oh, Father, Jesus promised us, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all people. I will draw all people to myself. 
just a few fleeting moments. But it isn't, it isn't difficult for us to imagine the cross, to see the Savior hanging there. And Father, it seems the right response for us to decide what shall we do now? Shall I really put everything I have and everything I am on the line so quickly to make this decision? Lord, Jesus did it with a rich young ruler. He was on the spot. He had, he had seconds to decide. But it was the call with no preparation before it. Give me everything and then come follow me. So we've had all the time we need to understand this decision. I pray for everyone who's standing before you and who said, I'm putting it all. I, I, I join them, Father. Who are we? We're just dusty earth children. But you have promised to raise up a generation of young and not so young who put their all on the altar for Christ, risking everything, career and home and possessions, risking it all for the f sake of the final harvest. Just one kernel. But look at all of us together. Think of what you could do with all of these kernels buried in the ground and then springing forth with a hundredfold for you. Please, dear God, do whatever it takes in the Georgia Cumberland Conference. We love the numbers we saw. You can double that. You can, you can, you can, you can quintuple that. Father, how many fold could you do? if you had all of us, all the time, for just you. So for those of us who have stood saying, it's all yours, honor that decision. And dear God, give us retentive memories. 24 hours from now, bring it back, Holy Spirit. 48 hours from now, bring it back. Begin a, a chain reaction of thinking that will creatively know how best to respond to the decision we've just made. You teach us, we follow. You're the master, Jesus. We're the disciples. You lead, we follow. We promise. And then, oh God, for these who are coming back, just happened to drop by today, hadn't planned it all to be here. But in this moment, you've tapped that heart and knocked on that door. Take her, take him, and whisper to him, Whisper to her, whisper to them they have made the greatest decision of their lives henceforth. The coming back to the Savior. The relinking with his friends and the recommitment to his mission. Bless it and lock in every one of those decisions. And finally, Father, for these who today check that third little box, as it were, I want to be baptized. I want to follow Jesus in baptism. Hallelujah. If there were only one here, the choirs of heaven are already singing the postlude. Father, there's more than one. Take every single one of these who has made that decision. And that phone call, that email will come in the next few hours. And into this new week, keep the decision burning brightly. Amen. Seal it. Seal him, seal her. And then as warriors of the King of Kings, send them forth. That's it. Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I'll draw all to me. And that's all we ask. For the glory and honor of our Savior, for whom it is our joy, our joy to follow. In Jesus' name, let all the people say, Amen, amen and Amen.